All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, if we can find our seats, we get settled in, and we will officially get started uh, with tonight's uh, midweek worship. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for uh, this evening. We thank you for the opportunity uh, to be in your house. And God, we have come to uh, worship you. We have come to uh, hear your word. God, we have come uh, with a heart and a mind that desires to know your word, to know it better, uh, to become more uh, literate as it pertains to reading your word and allowing room for the Holy Spirit to speak. God, I ask that these songs that we sing beforehand uh, would prime our hearts. And God would also just ready us uh, as we to open our eyes uh, and to experience more of you, God. We just thank you. And would you receive our songs of praise? And would you be, would you be pleased with what you hear and with what you see tonight? We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Father, we just thank you for this time. God, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here. Father, I pray that these songs would stir our hearts in a way that would connect with your word tonight. Uh, Father, I pray that these songs would help open our eyes to see the beauty of what it means to believe and to confess that you are truly uh, the Lord of all. God, we thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
All right. Well, good evening once again. I know it's kind of weird to greet you guys twice, but we just need to transition it over from our time of praise into our time of word. Um, but yeah, you know, I, uh, good evening. I do hope that everyone here is, is well, uh, that the Lord finds you well uh, this evening. And it looks like uh, the weather tonight has scared away a few people, which is okay. Better safe than sorry. And so for the past few weeks, uh, Pastor Jimmy has been leading us in our study on Wednesday nights. And, you know, what that's done is kind of given us a break from our in-depth study uh, into the book of Romans, which we are going to resume tonight, which I would imagine is to no surprise to anyone in this room. Uh, but before we jump back into our study, I think we need to kind of refresh our memories just a, a little bit. And, and one of the things that we do have to remind ourselves of constantly as we are approaching the book of Romans is that our intent, right, our, our focus is to gain a better understanding of the gospel while simultaneously trying to go into depth, right, the implications of not only our sin and our failure to save ourselves, but that, that the purpose would be that we could gain a deeper or, or more significant appreciation for the gospel. And while, that, while we are gaining a better understanding of the gospel, is establish a, I guess, stronger reliance on what God accomplishes for us through the gospel and trusting, right, that more and more in our lives, right? So the goal is that we would see our status, we would see the beauty of the gospel, and see how all of these are intertwined together by God's love for us, and how that is really solidifying the foundation for our salvation, but positioning us in a place to exemplify the salvation, the faith that we have in Christ, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. And being that we are in chapter 10 of Romans, and what we focused on leading up until this chapter has been God's sovereignty, hopefully some of this rings a bell. Uh, what we've been seeing is in God's sovereignty, where God has been patient with us, but he's also been gracious to us, and that in the, in the grand scheme of God's sovereignty, what we can uh, confidently say is that God is not unjust, meaning that God is not just picking and choosing who he wants to save, but God has done everything in his power to put into motion the opportunity and the availability of the gospel for anyone who would call upon him to be saved, right? And what that's doing is making salvation contingent not on our works, which is customary to the law, but is solely con contingent on what God has accomplished in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? And so putting all of this into perspective, the reason why Paul is laying out what he is uh, communicating is with the purpose that he knows his audience, right? And he's speaking to those who have been raised in Judaism since birth, right? Trying to undo uh, some of the things that they have set in terms of their mind, their hearts, and even their ways and trying to help them to see the beauty of the gospel and how that is for them. But unfortunately, if they continue to live solely according to the law and trying to do things according to the tradition of their forefathers, and unfortunately, right, as Paul is laying it out for them, they will not inherit the kingdom of God, right? So what Paul is doing and what we see just in his urgency and the plea of his heart is that they would see the beauty of the gospel and God's intertwining of the gospel from the very beginning in the Old Testament. All right. And so in the four verses of chapter uh, 10, uh, we, spent, um, we spent the majority of our time uh, a few weeks ago understanding how Christ is the end of the law because of the righteousness that he is for us. And all we need to do is to believe that, to understand that, and to trust in what Christ has accomplished. But more so, right, the beauty of what we're seeing is that it's from that confession, it's from that belief that that is where we are to operate. And so we're not called to operate out of a place of obligation because I have to do this. But what Paul is, what Paul is trying to put into perspective is that how the gospel changes us and out of the obedience of our heart, we can live for the kingdom of God. And as you can imagine, right, the Jews who have been raised from birth to trust the law and to uphold the law, a lot of what Paul is saying, a lot of what Paul is communicating, and a lot of what Paul is trying to convince them with is something that 
can be hard to fathom for them, right, because of just how long they've been doing things a particular way, all right? And so that's what, what, and so that's what makes what Paul addresses tonight in our verses uh, that we'll be studying so significant, right? So with all of that in mind, we, we have this idea, we have this intention of understanding believe and what it means to confess. And so with that said, if we could stand for the reading of our scripture tonight, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 5 to 13 in chapter 10. And um, we're going to cut it, our study at verse 10 and resume it next week because it just kind of got too long uh, with me trying to say all the things that I was stumbling upon, right? But this is what uh, Paul continues to write to his beloved uh, Jews in Rome. He says this with verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your hearts who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if, we can, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For, the heart, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's go ahead and get comfortable tonight. All right, we're just going to jump right into it. So when we look at verse 5, right, if we look at verse 5, Paul brings up what Moses had addressed to the Israelites, right? He says this, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. That the person who does the commandments shall live by him. And so what, Mo- what Moses addresses to the Israelites is something that he has received directly from God, right? A message that he is to speak until, unto the Israelites. And it's something that we actually see in Leviticus chapter 18 verses 4 and 5. Right? This is what God speaks to Moses telling him that you shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. You see, these verses state the purpose of the law. That if you obey it, guess what? You live. And the religious Jews would argue, but we did obey it, right? Because they're, obviously they're having this, this debate with, with Paul, right? Because he's obviously stating something different. He, oh, he's replaying how these conversations would go or how they have gone in, in, in the past. And so they would, they would argue that we do obey the law. We live by the law, right? So we should be what? Say, but Paul's response would be, it, you have only obeyed it outwardly. You didn't do it because you believed in your heart. It was merely something that was done surface level. And one Jewish interpretation of Leviticus chapter 8 verses 4 to 5 was that, was that those who would keep the commandments earn eternal life. But it is this misinterpretation of the passage, right, or this misinterpretation of the passage appears in Jewish texts alongside the view that God elects Israel as a whole to be saved. Right? So what that's communicating is that just if someone in your family upholds the law, then your entire, entire household would be saved. But what we have to understand about the law and upholding the law and obeying the law is that in order to be saved by the law, you actually had to execute them perfectly and flawlessly, which seems kind of impossible, right? But yet, nonetheless, right, the Jews still carried the stance of what? But we have obeyed the law, justifying their actions, justifying their lifestyle. But what we learn in the New Testament, especially through uh, the book of James, chapter 2, verse 10, well, this is what Jesus' brother says. He says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in what? In one point 
has become guilty of all of it. Right? Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of the law. In other words, what have they done? They have not kept the whole law. And so the reality that we see, right, as we're trying to gain a better understanding and appreciation of the gospel is that no one is really able to perfectly uphold the law and execute everything that is written in the Old Testament. The reality is that no one has been able to perfectly and lawlessly uh, uphold, uh, uh, I'm sorry, flawlessly uphold the law, and yet even still, the Jews, what do they do? They swear by it, and they continue to live by it, and according to these standards. And so if we have that in mind, right, so it is with this in mind that the truth that Paul is emphasizing here is that the man who pursues salvation by trying to keep the law will be what? Judged on the basis of that effort. Failures included. When we think about that, oftentimes when it comes to our own merits and our failures, we want to be judged by what? The things that we've been able to accomplish, right? We want to we we be judged by the good things that we have done. We want to be judged by the things that we were able to faithfully execute. But then the moment someone brings up the things that we have failed to do, what do we do? We, we try to justify our actions. We try to defend the things that we have done wrong. And it's because of that we have come to this realization, right, where that we need to come to this realization that the law is impossible to keep all of it. What I, what I mean by that, it is impossible for us to continuously, consistently, and perfectly execute everything that is written in the law. But the reality is, is that we all messed up, which is something that Paul has already established early on in the book of Romans, right? Saying that all are guilty and fall short of the glory of God, right? We all mess up no matter how strong or even mature we think we are. And it is because of this reality that the inevitable failure of works-based righteousness will result in eternity's basement. Right, not the upstairs. Hopefully you get what I mean, right? You ain't ain't, ain't going up, but you're going to go down. So when we think, so when we look at those, so when we think about that, we're trying to put all of this together, and then we look at verses 6 to 7, The switch is from works toward faith. And this is what Paul says. He says, but, right, in in the same conversation, in the same breath, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will descend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Now, at first glance, it kind of sounds a little weird, right? But you have to remember that Paul is addressing uh, issues to the Jews, and the Jews would be somebody who have a strong familiarity with the things that are said throughout the Old Testament, especially the Torah. With, just in case you're unfamiliar with the Torah, though, those are the first five books of the Old Testament. And what Paul is doing is he is showing that the knowledge of the will of God has been made perfectly accessible. And that no one was ever required to do what was impossible in order to attain it. You see, this knowledge was neither hidden. It wasn't something that was far off. But in in Paul's eyes, especially through the revelation of Jesus Christ, is that these things were made obvious while also being made fully available. So when Paul quotes the questions, he's quoting, right, Deuteronomy 30, which we don't have on the screen for the sake of time, but essentially it says, who shall bring down, but it's in light of who shall bring Christ down from heaven, who shall bring Christ up from among the dead ones. Theologian William Kelly gives us a little bit of more uh, insight into this matter. He says that man could do neither, but God in grace meets man. It was the Father who sent his Son into the world. It was by the glory of the Father that he raised, he raised him from the dead. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, and God has raised him from the dead. All right, so a, a, a phrasing I believe that all of us are very familiar with because we see a, a good chunk of John 3.16 in there. You see, in other words, what, what, what Paul is trying to communicate, 
What Paul is trying to get through the thick head of the Jews is that we don't need to bring Christ down from heaven because God the Father has already done so. And what Christ has accomplished in terms of righteousness is something that is now readily accessible. But the contingency is that it is readily accessible for those who would believe. You see, it is a glorious, accomplished fact, and our response is to believe that and to trust into that. Where Our, our goal or the thing that Paul is uh, adamantly uh, pushing us to pursue is that we would continually trust not in the works of man and the things that we have tried to done, tried to do even though we've been successful at some of these things, but that we would wholeheartedly believe and trust in what God has already accomplished on our behalf through his one and only son, Jesus Christ. You know, I saw a great analogy studying for tonight, and it was, it was do, done. And sometimes you hear that phrase is do or don't, right? That's kind of our, uh, uh, the, the ma- mantra for some of the things that we might pursue in life. But this one in particular was do or done. And I'll read to you guys the, 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 the story that's attached with it. See, there's a wide difference between your religion and mine, said a Christian lady to one in, whom, in, in, to one in whose spiritual condition she had been long interested in. Indeed, said he, how is that? Your religion, she replied, has only two letters in it, and mine has four. It seems that this gentleman was one of the uh, one of that numerous class seeking to get to heaven by doing, by their doings, right? By attention to ordinances and ceremonies, by what the apostle in the ninth uh, of Hebrew terms dead works. But he did not understand about the two letters or the four. His friend had often spoken to him, and on the occasion to which our antidote refers, she had called to take her leave of him for some time, and she was about to go home. And he asked her, what do you mean by two letters and four? Her response was, why, or I'm saying, um, her response was, why, your religion is D-O. Do, whereas mine is D O N E. This was all that passed. The lady took her leave, but her words remained and did their work in the soul of her friend, a revolutionary work, verily. The entire current of his thoughts was changed. Do is one thing, done is quite another. The former is legalism, the latter is Christianity. It was a novel and a very original mode of putting the gospel, but it was just the mode for a legalist and the Spirit of God used in the conversion of this gentleman. When he, met, when he next met his friend, he said to her, well, I can now say with you that my religion is D-O-N-E, done. He had learned to fling aside the deadly doings and rest in the finished work of Christ. He was led to see that it was no longer what he could do for God, but what God had already done for him. I like that. D-O versus D-O-N-E. You see, reliance on the law is to D-O, to do. But trusting in what Christ has already done is all that we really need. Right, like put that into perspective. Like when we think of the way that we pursue our lives or the way that we would uh, we pursue living this life for the glory of God, even though we know that the work of Christ has already done, it's already accomplished, there are times where we, we find ourselves trying to earn God's favor or earn God's blessing by our doings. When in actuality, what the things that earn us God's blessing is simply God's gift to, to us. And so when you think about your life in its current state, do you find yourself depending on the D-O's or the D-O-N-E, right? We, especially what Paul is communicating, we need to trust in what Christ has done. We need to continually lean on what Christ has already done because there is no adding to it and there is no subtracting to what Christ has already done. And so when you think about all that, and with all that in mind, right, we look, then we look at what Paul continues to address by looking at verses 8 to 9. He says this, but what does it say? 
The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him to the dead, you will be what? Saved. But there's no mistake that I, 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 I had a saying, here I am to worship and put that line in there that call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Because that's all it takes. All it takes is to call upon him to save you and he will. But here we see Paul quoting the Old Testament again. Because once again, who is he speaking to? The Jews. And what do they know? What do they know very well? It is the Old Testament. It's the Torah. And this time he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14, where it says, But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so that you can do it. What Paul is communicating by <clears throat> Well, and what Paul is communicating by quoting Deuteronomy is that he is affirming what the Word of God was doing or what it was already doing. It was near, it was accessible, it was intelligible, and it was easily attained, but not in the manner that the Jews had, had become accustomed to. Many Jews during this time tended to think that they had to go on an altar or, uh, or, or some sort of meeting place to be saved. Right, that God wasn't somebody who was near and dear, but God was somebody that they had to go out and find him in a particular place. And yes, that's how God established himself and kind of gave the groundwork for the Israelites to operate. But that didn't mean that he was inaccessible. What God was doing, he was making himself accessible. Right? And so when we think about that, salvation is available to where you are now because of what? Because of Jesus. Right? It's closer than it's ever been, and it's been easier to receive than all of the efforts trying to uphold the law. And yes, like, you know, coming to church, it's great. Right? But coming to church isn't going to save you. Right? You don't have to come to church and, and to openly uh, confess a, 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 a prayer saying, God, I want to accept you into my heart. You know, if, if you were to do that at, at your home, guess what? It works the same. Right? You know? Uh, not not to jump into uh, the stories of the past, but even when, when I was when I first came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, right? I, it, I was just in the eighth grade one day in my room, just kind of pondering and reflecting on the things that God had been doing in my life and the way that God was pursuing me. And that night, I just I, I, from my bed, I, I I prayed the prayer that we're taught the prayer if we to pray if we want to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And from there. It was game over, right? I didn't have to say, well, well, mom, can you take me to church? I need to go pray. And I didn't say, mom, when, when are we going to church? Or I didn't have to wait till Sunday or anything of that nature, right? We, we have to see just how accessible God is, right? Because God is the one who's already done the work. God is the one who's sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, right? It's a D-O-N-E. And those are the things that are actively pursuing us. And so, right, it's not about upholding the law, right? But it's about understanding what Christ has done. Because when we look at verse 9, it says this. It says, if you confess with, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe what you are saying in your heart with the things that are coming out of your mouth, right, that God raised him from the dead, then you will be what? You will be saved. But we have to understand what confess means. Right? Confess comes from the Greek word homologeo, and it means to say the same and so to agree in one's statement. Homologeo means to express openly one's allegiance to a proposition or a person. And in this context, the person of Christ. It is a statement of identification, faith, confidence, and trust. Right. So when we are confessing with our mouth, we are supposed to be confessing that what Jesus is Lord. In other words, Jesus is the one who is able to to save. Or Jesus is the one who has saved me. And, you know, we think about a confession, and, you know, while that sounds simple, I think the essence of an outward confession stems from a profound inward confession. Or, I'm sorry, conviction. Now, confession, like, when I think about it today, a confession may not hold the same weight that it did that it once did, especially during the, old, the New Testament times. But nonetheless, a confession must come from something that exists within the heart. 
Right? It's, it's, it's not a confess, confess with your mouth and then hope that it, it takes place in the heart. It's quite the opposite. Right? It is the Holy Spirit at work uh, making the things of God known to us, dwelling in our heart, really taking its place. And from there, we are able to make the confession that Jesus is Lord. And so when it comes to the confession that Jesus is Lord, the confession that Jesus is Lord is meant, uh, means the acknowledgement that Jesus shares the name, the nature, the holiness, the authority, the power, the majesty, and, and the eternity of the one and only true God. Like we have to understand that when we confess that Jesus is Lord, that this is what you're saying, this is the statement that you're backing not only through your mouth, but through your heart, but more importantly, with the way that you would live your life. Right? Our confession is declaring all of those things to be true, but to also be reigning in our, in our lives. Right? There, there's a distinct difference between uh, making the attempt to confess that Jesus is Lord, but not believing that and having your life reflect that, opposed to making the bold Com, uh, confession that Jesus is Lord and your life ends up reflecting that very statement. You see, Martin Luther, right, takes it a step further. And yesterday uh, was uh, uh, Reformation Day, thanks to Luther and his 95 theses that he nailed to the door of the Catholic Church, right? But he says this, he says, the life of Christianity consists of possessive pronouns, not, those, not, not the kind of pronouns out in the world we have today, but possessive pronouns. Right? It is one thing to say Christ is a Savior. It is quite another thing to say that he is my Savior and my Lord. The difference is that the devil can say the first and make a statement declaring that, yeah, he, that, that, that Jesus guy is a Christ. But for us, the true Christian alone can say the second. In other words, we as Christians don't say that, oh, yeah, Jesus is the Lord of all the earth. No, no, we say Jesus is my Lord. And he rules and he reigns over all the earth. You see, when we confess, uh, when we confess sin, this confession is more than a mere acknowledgement of sin and in life. It is, a, it, is, it is an agreeing with God as to all the implications to enter in the fact that one has sinned. It is looking at that sin from God's point of view and acting accordingly. It means putting away of that sin. It means the determination to be done with that sin. And that is only possible, right, when we are looking to God and making those confession, confessions with the possessive pronouns. Because he's my God. Because he is my Savior. And so to reiterate, the idea of confession or confessing is not just to say with our, our lips, right? It's not a lip service, right? Jesus says that the Pharisees honor, honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far. But to validate the lips confession, with, right, it has to be done with life's direction. Right? Once again, there's a difference between trying to make a claim and then actually making the claim and living by it. It will, it will reveal itself through our lives. And so we cannot be deceived. Right? We cannot be deceived thinking that making the statement is going to forever change our lives. But, but it is through that confession that positions our lives to be changed by God because we believe the very thing that we are confessing. And so one must confess Christ with his mouth, but he must also confess him through his righteous behavior. Our beloved uh, Charles Spurgeon adds, and he, I, I, didn't, I didn't put it up there because it's kind of lengthy. But he says this. He says, believe, we believe everything which the Lord Jesus has taught, but we must go a step further and trust him. It is not in, even enough to believe in him as being the son of God and the anointed of the Lord, but we must believe on him. The faith that saves is not believing certain truths or even believing that Jesus is a savior. But it is resting on him, depending on him, lying with all your weight on Christ as the foundation of your hope. Believe that he can save you. Believe that he will save you. At any rate, leave the whole matter of your salvation with him in unquestioning confidence. 
Depend on him without fear as to your present and eternal salvation. This is the faith which saves the soul. And so let us wrap up our time together looking at verse 10. And we'll keep it short because we'll finish looking at verses 10, uh, 11, all the way to the end uh, of this particular passage. But this is what he says in verse 10. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth we confess and we are saved. The reality is, is that believing is something that is done, or is, that is, is something that is done, or being done inwardly. And it is our confession that is done outwardly. Some might say that confession is faith made audible. Some might even say that confession is faith made visible. And if that is the case, if that is the case, may we continue to believe, but may we also continually confess that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And from there, would we allow the work of the gospel to do the rest? Because why? It is already D-O-N-E. We just need to live with that truth dwelling in our hearts. And from there, may it fuel the way that you and I conduct ourselves in this world while the confession of not just our hearts but our lives expresses that Jesus is truly our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us pray. We'll stand and close in prayer. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this great reminder. But, Father, I also pray that we would be challenged to see how the belief and the confession that we possess in our lives is not something that is meant to be contained inwardly, but it is something that is meant to be expressed outwardly. And so, Father, I pray the the convictions that we have, the work that you are doing in our lives, the work that you are doing in our hearts, will that be the very source of life that is pumped uh, throughout uh, our veins and expressed into the way that we would live this life for you. Father, I pray that, way that we would, the way that we would love people will be a confession that, Jesus, you are truly our Lord. The way that we would show compassion and mercy, and the way that we would extend grace and forgiveness, will that continually be an outward expression of the confession that exists in our hearts. Father, I pray more than just saying this with our lips, but it would be something that we truly believe and that dwells in our hearts and is expression of the way that we live our lives for you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for continually being patient with us. Thank you for allowing your grace to truly move in our lives and to mold us into the people that you have saved and redeemed us to be. We thank you that it is D-O-N-E. And now we just ask that the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and may the unconditional love of God, our Father, and may the anointing, the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit truly equip you, be with you, guide you, and lead you until you uh, meet in God's house once again. Amen and amen. Thank you, church. May you go.